This program features live coverage of an African safari and may include animal kills and carcasses. Viewer discretion is advised. Hello everyone and a very warm welcome to a sunset driver. We are in the Mara Triangle in Kenya and we have that beautiful tree out in the savannah. Well, my name is David, that has not changed. And with me on camera is Bungay. Bungay, good afternoon. So this come up, so cameramen they always confuse me. Sometimes they do that, sometimes they do that, sometimes they do that. And the only one I would understand is one gentleman in South Africa called Senzo, because Senzo used to do this. And when I asked him why does that hit on me, he got three daughters, and I think they were triplets. Anyhow, welcome to the Mara Triangle, and it's not a warm day, but a hot day. I do not know whether you can see a bit of shimmering from where we are. As we show you the savannah, it is 88 degrees Fahrenheit. And for those who love doing the metric system, 31 degrees centigrade. That to me by any standard is too hot. And that doesn't sound very good for me because I would guess most of the cats Unlike the big animals could be lazing somewhere in the shade until it cools off. Remember, we usually come to you live and direct, and we always request you to ask us as many questions as you can. Should you have any nice comments, like saying, wow, that's beautiful savannah, please do send them through hashtag Safari Live on Twitter. And I think I've done very well in terms of housekeeping, and I just want you to enjoy that view of what... I would call the Mara Savannah of the Mara Triangle in Kenya. Exactly, and yeah, M in the final control says this one is one landscape that you will not, or it cannot be matched by anybody else. When we will go to Juma, you will notice always the vegetation is very different. And I was joking to Bungay the other day, telling him, I think with the good binoculars here in the Mara, you can see an elephant 10 kilometers away, you know, which is very possible. But while in Juma, it's very tricky. If you would see an elephant 100 meters away, you'll always be very, very lucky. Now, you notice how tall the grass is. And that tall grass you see is called the red, red oat grass. And it will get taller and taller until the wildebeest will come to mow it down in the next maybe six or seven months or thereabout. Well, out here in the African wilderness, I'm not the only one. And there's a beautiful girl by the name of Jamie who would like to say maybe something like Jumbo Jumbo to all of you. David might be able to see across 10 kilometers on a nice clear day in the Maasai Mara. I drove past these wild dogs the first time and had to turn around and come and double check the area before we finally spotted them. But spot them we did. A very good afternoon to all of you. My name is Jamie. This afternoon, as Sebastian is on camera with me and he didn't see them either. Nope. The first time we drove past them, it's really very, very embarrassing. We're coming to you live from Juma Private Game Reserve, which is in the Greater Kruger National Park area of South Africa. Right, here's what everybody needs to do. We need to all hope, like absolute crazy, that these doggies decide to stick around and stay on Juma right up until half past seven, at which point they can, if they wish, depart. But up and until that moment, they absolutely have to stay here. Preferably not in that tree though. They are hidden beneath a, such dense vegetation that they are almost impossible to see. And I suppose I should call them in on the game drive radio. I haven't yet, but I will, I'll get to that in a little bit. We've only just found them. We owe Ali, Koli, and Lauren and Trishala this particular wild dog sighting as they were out earlier scouting about for animals and they came upon these wild dogs and one of them actually barked at them because they were looking for their tracks to try and figure out where they went on foot so there we go we have our collection of incredibly flat incredibly well hidden wild dogs to keep us entertained and the thing is is that Seb and I are not going anywhere <laughs> Emma says, at least we know, at least they're breathing. 
given how much dust they have on their noses. Yes, they are definitely breathing. They're panting away quite happily. It is muggy, Seb, you're right. Mm -hmm. I know, I was, I was wondering why Seb was saying it was so warm and we had to drive a bit, but actually it is really muggy. It's sweaty weather. Yeah. It's not that hot. I don't think Juma's that hot yeah. today, but it is very, very humid. <clears throat> I assume that it's the same pack that Tristan had this morning. In fact, I'm not even going to say I assume. I know it is the same pack as of wild dogs that Tristan had this morning, which would make it, I assume, the Imbali pack is what I was actually going to say. All the investic breakaways. We <laughs> probably, I imagine, will not be calling them the investic breakaways tonight on SABC3. <laughs> Look at those enormous ears. I know, spoilt. Dogs twice in a day. We're hoping for other things as well. We've been, Seb and I won the lucky draw here. The dogs are the only animals that we know of that have been found so far today. And we got sent here immediately because we've got the special thermal camera. We've got the FLIR. So we're feeling thoroughly spoiled. We, we drew the long straw. We got very lucky. It does make sense with the thermal camera though, in case they decide to vanish into the darkness, which is going to be almost impossible for us to keep up. Right now, it's very hard to imagine these dogs racing around, but they absolutely do, I promise. Well, speaking of someone who presumably isn't racing around quite as fast as a wild dog, off you pop to James so he can say hello. No, I'm not racing around. I'm based on a Sunday. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Sunday afternoon. Sunday safari, sunset safari. I don't know why I have to say it like that. Uh, but we are on... There's an Amakwa Dove. Did you see it, David? It looks like an emerald-spotted wood dove, but with a very long tail. Sorry, everyone. Welcome to the end of the Sunset Safari. Marvellous to have you all with us. We are on our way down, hopefully, towards Spindam to see if we can find Hosanna or some other form of spotted cat. There it is. Can you see it flying there? Everybody, I'm just going to... Mm, no, it's flown over the road. The macro dove definitely looks like an emerald spotted wood dove. Stand by one, I'll find your picture. <laughs> Please ask us any questions you'd like to using the hashtag SafariLive on Twitter. Otherwise, of course, the YouTube chat stream will work just as effectively. You might get lost in the chatter, so I'd suggest the Twitter. You know, certainly in the first part of the drive, because what will happen in the beginning of the drive is uh, <laughs> I'll get back to you with what's just been said to me because of course all of you are greeting each other currently on the chat which means that any biological query is lost in amongst all of you saying hello to each other which is very friendly uh, of course but possibly not the best for questions I'm not saying you should stop saying hello to each other it's very nice to see right the Namakwa dove is this fellow here number five and you can see it looks a little bit like an emerald spotted wood dove. It's got little purplish spots, actually. I didn't realize that. And the long tail. And that's definitely what we had. Now, interestingly, they are much more common in drier areas than they are in these, well, I hesitate to call this a wet area, but you'd expect them to find them in the drier areas of the Kruger. And that doesn't really uh, bode well, because, of course, it means that everything's dry. Then I've just been asked by Tristan uh, to say Kauli's name in the in a Cockney accent. Well, I'll do it in a Cockney accent. Um, so a Cockney accent, I'll just need to lead up to it a little bit. I don't think we're going to see Kauli today. I don't know where he is. I think he's sitting in his room, Kauli. That would be in a Cockney accent. The accent I was doing, however, before that was North Country. And uh, I can do it in a North Country accent as well. Ah, say. Look at that! There's Coley. 
is going out hunting for animals today. I heard another uh, wonderful little skit. Did I do this? No, I just did this for you, David. I didn't do it for anyone else. A skit on, <laughs> on the interwebs the other day of two of the Game of Thrones actresses doing the first few lines of Hakuna Matata uh, in that sort of North Country accent that they use in Game of Thrones. So. Our area has fallen down. They did Hakuna Matata like that, and it's been something like this Hakuna Matata. Wonderful days. Hakuna Matata. It ain't no passing phrase. We didn't go through a dip, Emma. David, who is on camera today, but may as well be asleep. Let the aerial fall down. Are we, are we good now, David? I think so. so should I do it again, Emma? Hakuna Matata. What a wonderful phrase. Hakuna Matata. Int nor passing craze. Me too. I'm also waiting for the casting calls. Thank you very much, Emma. Emma says she's waiting for the casting calls to come in. I think I would do well on Game of Thrones, frankly. I'm not sure what part I play. Especially as I think they're filming the last season as we speak. In the meantime, while I wait for my phone to ring with casting calls, oh. Hang on a second. Oh, uh, yes, you got to Jamie. Yes, I'd love to. I think that sounds like a wonderful idea. Yes, how much? I have an unfortunate lack of skill in the accent department, or at the very least, I can't off the top of my head imitate an accent. But then what happens to me is as soon as I'm talking to someone who has a strong accent from wherever it happens to be, completely unintentionally and without, you know, without even thinking about it so completely subconsciously i start to speak back to them in their accent which leads to a great amount of misunderstanding because of course they think i'm mocking them and they become quite offended and that's happened to me quite a few times in my life where i've been speaking to someone from scotland or ireland or australia or america and i start to imitate their accent and i don't know why i do it and i can't help myself it's not intentional but I cannot. It's very uncomfortable. It's an incredibly uncomfortable feeling when all of a sudden you realize that you sound as though you're parodying them. Unfortunately, the heavier my South African accent gets these days, because of course I live in the low felt, the less that seems to happen to me because the South African accent is one that well and truly entrenches itself upon your soul. It's also the hardest one to imitate. I don't know many people who can imitate a South African accent well. And because naturally there's the, the typical rivalry of various countries, we get quite insulted if someone mistakes us for an Australian or a New Zealander. No mind too much if we're mistaken for a Zimbabwean or a Botswanan. Botswanian? Botswan? What do you call them? Botswanian? I can't think. I mean, I'm really just babbling at you because right now at this exact point, there is nothing I can do to improve your view of the dogs. And they are very, very much asleep. Now, well, if we imagine all of the animals speaking in different accents, it becomes even more hilarious. Wild dogs would speak with a... Hmm. Oh, I could get myself into trouble for doing this. I'm thinking the same. I feel as though a wild dog... Leopards definitely have a French accent. Really? <laughs> Save the back goes, really. <laughs> oh well, yes, I suppose if we if we stick to if we stick to 
South African accents. No, I don't think wild dogs would have a scent in Johannesburg accent. I think they'd... Oh, no, they're not laid back enough for a Cape Townian accent. Definitely not a Cape Townian hipster accent. Hmm. No, maybe Em's right. Are you one of those high-powered businessmen in Joburg? Hmm. No, it doesn't fit either. Italian. Italian. Yeah. I like that. I could see it. Ah, yeah. oh, I'm. Oh, you see, I'm. I can't do an accent. Mamma mia. <laughs> oh, mamma mia. mia. I don't. I wasn't listening. I was saying mamma mia repeatedly. Uh, <laughs> the wild dogs. Like that? Uh, something about Investic Pack. I think he'd probably have been asking why they were called the Investic Pack. They're breakaways from the original Investic Pack. But the Ah, right. I got it. Alex says, we were discussing accents. Alex says that that's why they're called the Investic Pack, if they happen to have proper Joburg high-powered accents. Maybe it wasn't dust on their noses, Sid. <laughs> Maybe it was a bit of leaf. <laughs> Daniel says that he loves the Italian accent. Ah, yes, indeed. I, I think it works. I think Sev's right. I think Italian works quite well. Of course, Alex is in FC now. I'm wondering what animal would have a Russian accent. Hmm, mm. cheetah. I'm going with cheetah. Maybe not. You see, it's ridiculous because we're talking about all African animals, which, of course, doesn't quite work. I have no idea, and I have no idea if anyone else is following along with my trains of thought this afternoon, or if you go across to Tristan, who's presumably a great deal more sensible than I am. Well, I don't know if that's probably the case, Jamie, in any way whatsoever. As sensible between the three of us is probably not really going to happen. But I was intrigued in this conversation, and I can't believe Jamie forgot which animals would have a Russian accent. It's quite obvious, really, that it would be Boris the Blade and Vladimir from Chitwa Dam. They would both have Russian accents. Crocodiles would make a perfect Russian um, mobster. I think it would be the right kind of um, animals for the Russian accent. And as for the wild dogs i think they would have a per like i think a really good one would be a english soccer hooligan accent which is i don't really know what exactly a soccer hooligan accent is but that's what i think that they would have and they'd run around just causing havoc wherever they go that's how i feel about the wild dogs but this accent story is quite funny we often we often go through these kind of notions as to what accents um certain animals would have. Oh, hello, dwarf mongoose. Are you one of the ones that survived Clalumba? I'm just trying to see if there's any others. It doesn't seem like, like there is any others at all at the moment. It's probably a good opportunity for me to also say hello properly. My name's Tristan. On camera, I've got BK this afternoon. There we go. So BK is once again out and about, and hopefully he's going to bring us more luck. It seems BK is the lucky charm for all of us at the moment, because BK in the last 24 hours has seen a honey badger, he has seen two leopards in a sighting, one stealing a kill from another. He has seen wild dogs this morning. He had, and what else have you had? Oh, lots of ellies, all kinds of things. So BK is now the new lucky charm, and that's why I've, I've stolen him for the afternoon safari, and I'm going to make sure that he brings us luck for this afternoon. I certainly are going to need it. We're going to head off towards Torchwood, and we're going to need luck for one signal, two for a leopard and two or uh, three to be able to get a leopard in a signal area on Torchwood. So that's why we need BK's luck this afternoon. It's a tall ask, but we shall try and endeavor to bring a, some sort of spotty rosetted cat to you guys. Now, what is interesting is that last night, I got an update today about this. So last night, um, 
the guys said that on their way home, some of the Inkoro guys on their way home, which would have been at about just about 10 to 7, quarter to 7, um, they said they got that skittish big male leopard coming out from the Mulawati Twin Dams area going towards Baboon Pan. And they said that he was salivating quite heavily. So I don't know what he was up to and what he's doing inside Juma, but I fear that he is starting to make more and more of a push the more that Tingana has not really been hanging around that side. So it's not ideal. We need Tingana to go back down that way and push the skittish male back where he's come from because we do not need a skittish male leopard around, or certainly not as skittish as what he is. You know, Hukumuri was one thing because Hukumuri would at least allow you to find him and then he would kind of move off. This male seems to be an absolute ghost during the day. And the guys were telling me last night that when they found him, as soon as the second car arrived, he was gone in a second. So one car, you see, apparently was okay at night um, with the spotlight, but as soon as the second car arrived, he didn't want anything to do with anyone and moved off. And so I wonder how far he's pushing into Juma these days and whether or not the tracks that we're seeing a lot of the time are actually for him or if they're for, you know, Hosano or Tingana or Hukamuri. It's an interesting kind of events, turn of events that's taking place and it's certainly going to be an interesting winter if this carries on. The other bit of news that I do have from Little Gari is that the den site on Little Gari is active um, once again so Corky and Pretty are still at the den site on Little Gari and it is still active so that's where they are at the moment um, and they seemingly uh, everybody is doing fine apparently they all the little ones are still there now um, Emma, if you can just repeat the name for me, sorry, I caught the question, but I didn't catch the name. I was too busy talking, as per normal, which happens a lot when it's with me, unfortunately. Becky. So Becky and Tingana hasn't really been sawing, no, he hasn't really. Although, you know, last night he looked good. He didn't saw because he was too busy trying to feed his face once more and, and just going into full sausage mode. Um, so he chased Tandy off, and then what I... Well, why we're going to head to Torchwood is partly to go and see where the two of them ended up going. No one actually checked that area this morning with the wild dogs and Clalumba, and there was lions on, on Buffalo's Hook. Everyone kind of was busy with those things. So we're going to go and check that area quite carefully, and we're going to hope that we're going to be able to pick up tracks for where the two of them went, if they followed one another, if they split, whatever the case may be. But that's what we're going to go and try and see and try and figure out where they've gone. There's tracks for a leopard here, but these have been driven over. So that's for a female leopard, probably or in all likelihood Tandy from a few days ago. And the other sort of bit of news that I have is also the Inkuhumas are miles away. So they're all the way in Robson's, which is north of Singita. So they're a long, long way away. Hopefully they'll come back fairly soon. Anyway, talking about lions, it sounds like David is on the search for the sausage tree pride. And hopefully he'll have some luck this afternoon. Well, I don't think I need to talk about the accents. I need to talk about the taste because uh, what I'm looking for is the sausage tree pride. So I'm talking about tests. We can change the topic a bit. And from accents, let's talk about the tests of these animals. When, when each one of the, say the cats, they eat different, uh, you know, different, different prey. When they hunt, for example, impalas to thompson gazelles to waterbucks to zebras what tests do they ever get the test i mean i would want to uh, have a little discussion with jamie and james and tristan and finding out do these animals tell the difference now i'm assuming let's take lions for example lions have been known to hunt wildebeest zebras elans giraffes buffaloes and especially the pride that i'm looking for where i am the sausage tree pride and i would want to know when they eat all right let's continue that my topic later let's first go to james who could be having a very interesting mm -hmm. Hello everybody, here we have got a knob-billed duck. I know that's not its real name anymore, it is now the comb duck, but I just like the term knob-billed because, well, it doesn't look like it's got a comb, does it, David? It looks like it's got a very large knob on its head. 
and it is waddling slowly towards us with its knob. And for once, the missus is following the, the male and not the other way around. See them eating grass seeds? That's quite cool. I was going to have to look up what they eat, but I'm going to tell you now, they eat grass seeds. Lily, you say, have we seen one of these before? Yes, we have absolutely seen one of these before, Lily. Jamie found this knob bull duck in this very pond. Uh, I think it was about five days ago or so, I think. So yes, we've seen this very individual and we've seen his wife. And the two of them are very much enjoying a little bit of, it looks like signal grass to me. No, it's some chlorus, actually. Isn't that cool? It doesn't associate seed eating with knobber billed ducks or indeed any kind of duck. Let me have a look and see if they eat anything else. Duh for duck. Here we go. No, it is in fact called the knob billed duck still. That's nice. Uh, well, let's have a look. I don't know, Kathy. what is the knob made of? I suspect it's, uh, because they lose it outside of breeding season, so I suspect it's some kind of skin. Let's have a look. Adult male breeding, crown, center of hind neck, upper blah, 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 blah. Bill black with large, laterally compre compressed, fleshy comb or knob on the upper mandible and prominent nail so it's basically fleshy so i think it's kind of a soft fleshy thing that grows there each season it is much reduced outside of the breeding season let's see what it eats it has been recorded eating the following Oh, well, this is quite interesting. The breeding male has a feeding or loafing territory with variable boundary in which he feeds with his mate. And sometimes with unmated females. Dirty fellow. <laughs> breeding birds may dabble in the mud or strip grass seeds while wading in shallow water. Females probably dabble more than males. Two breeding males, blah, blah, blah. Fish paste, fish paste. Mm-hmm. Right, so they've been recorded eating largely grass seeds, actually. And then sometimes water lilies. Yeah, grass seeds, that's their, that's their, that's their vibe. Hmm. They just gave a long list of the kinds of grass seeds they like. Rosalind, no, I don't think there are many mobile ducks in Juma at all, because this is the only one I've seen. And in fact, this mobile duck is not in fact in Juma at all. He is in fact in Little Gari, which is unfortunate. Strange place for him to have chosen to use. David, when you come bring the camera back to me, you need to make a clicking sound so that I know. All right. No, you didn't. I see, you didn't want them to hear it, so you did it quietly. Anyway, I'm sorry you got a view of the back of my head. It's David's fault. Let's press on from the Nobel Duck. We have a lovely sighting here of a white Ford Ranger uh, with a ladder on the back. Very good. It's a very nice, relaxed Nobel Duck, I must say. All right, I believe that David was mid-conversation when we found the Nobel duck, so let's go back across to him to find out what it was he was going to say. Well, uh, I got interrupted by that feathered friend of James Halia, which is 
Paul is interesting because the times you catch a bird and you put it in the frame, then it goes away. Now, I decided we change the topic from the accents of animals, you know, and we do something different and we do tests of the predators. I'm talking about hyenas, lions, cheetahs, leopards, wild dogs, like what Jamie have. And the way I want us to look at this is, for example, say a pride, like what I'm looking for, the Sausage Pride, has about five females, two males, and a couple of youngsters now. Should they catch, or maybe should maybe three of those girls catch a, say, a zebra, maybe late in the evening, and then we shall have the other lions coming in the darkness. So if the rest of them join the party or join the dinner when it's already dark, do they know or will the lions always tell what they're eating? Of course it is meat, of course it is proteins. So what I'd want us to discuss is the lions that come much later on, or assume you blindfold them and they just come and they start digging in and eating whatever was hunted before. I mean, do the cats or do the hyenas or other predators across the board, do they know what type of meat they're eating? I mean, they got test bats, I guess. I'm not sure of this, but I would imagine, just like us human beings, the predators got test bats on their tongues. So can they tell meat of a zebra from a wildebeest, of this animal from the other? And personally, I am very bad in that. The only meat I can tell 100% it is pork. If I eat pork, I know it's pork. There are sometimes I'll eat lamb and goat. We have what you call goats here in Africa. And I'll always ask the chef, what, what meat are we eating? And then we got a chef in the camp called David, like me. And he asked, tell me, don't be silly. What do you think you're eating? I mean, I have no idea. I know it is meat. And he tells me, keep eating. And I would ask him, how do I know what I'm eating? And he says, if it's very chewy, then it's beef. It's very soft, it's lamb, which doesn't make sense to me anyway. Brent, you're talking of what you think it may taste if it's like sugar. I think you got a point. I think you got a point. What you need to do, Brent, now is to put uh, Jamie, Tristan and James and ask them either one, if they know, and if they do, how, would, how, how can we help maybe the viewers tell that when a lion is eating, say, a zebra, this is the way it eats, and maybe this is the way it behaves. When a lion is eating a buffalo, this is the way it behaves. I, I think it is sounds rather a stupid topic, a stupid topic, but I think it's always good to maybe uh, ask ourselves, I mean, do predators know what meat they're eating? If they get meat in the darkness, they find other family members eating the same. Are they like, well, we had a zebra yesterday and we have zebra again today. Pfft. You know, with the lack of better choice, we'll keep eating it. Anyhow, I'm sure I'm giving them a lot of uh, pressure, but I am in an area that I call the Sausage Republic, which is this one. I was here yesterday for three hours and I got a bit frustrated because I never saw them. And let's find out what Jamie will say, because she got wild dogs. Wild dogs are very good, successful hunters. Let's see what Jam uh, Jamie will say in terms of wild dogs testing the meat. I, perhaps, I, I, I would say that there's probably some really fundamental differences between the way that the wild dogs behave here in Juma as opposed to in the Maasai Mara. It's such a different hunting habitat that it really is almost incomparable for an animal that hunts in the way that the wild dogs do here in Juma. They, they're not animal, they don't chase down animals to the point of exhaustion in the way that people always believed that wild dogs did, with one pack member overtaking another when the pack member got tired. It doesn't work like that here. There's no vast open stretches of land where they go sprinting off after prey. And I don't think that the wild dogs deliberately select anything to be honest. I think obviously the impala form the main part of their diet because there are so many impala, impala and scrub hares. And that's just because that those are the animals that they encounter the most. But I don't think their behavior really changes. They just get up and they run and they trot and they see something and they run at it. 
and they create panic and chaos in thick vegetation because they're so agile and so quick and they are able to pick out an individual and eventually manage to catch it. So I don't think there's any differences in behavior in terms of the the diet that they follow. They've been recorded to even hunt baby buffalo. Obviously, it also depends on pack size. If a baby, if a buffalo herd went running past a pack of four wild dogs, there would be absolutely no chance, I would say, that they're even going to attempt something that large. Where if you've got, say, the Hamilton's pack of 18 wild dogs, well, then that would probably make a difference to their prey selection. But mostly it's opportunistic. Ah, now there we go. Child of the universe is wondering from that if wild dog packs in the in Juma and the Mara are of different sizes. Not to the best of my knowledge. Wild dog packs can be highly variable in size. It also, of course, depends on their success when it comes to that year's litter of cubs. Because, I mean, pups. I don't know where I got cubs from. Pups. Because, of course, a female can have loads of pups at one go. She can have 10, she can have more than 10 pups. And if they manage to keep them alive, obviously that's a massive boost to their numbers. So wild dog pack numbers grow and shrink quite rapidly, then you get your dispersal packs as well. So it really, it, I don't think that there is much difference to the best. Obviously I have never once seen a wild dog in the Mara. Uh, I know that they have been seen live twice, but I certainly didn't see one while I was there. So as far as I'm aware, no. There's no real difference between the pack sizes of the Mara or on Juma, or if there is, it's an, on average, the difference of one or two dogs, I would guess. I can't see, you know, having that many, that many individuals, there's always a cutoff point. The same goes for lion prides. If you have too many individuals in a social group of predators, there's never, it might help with hunting but it also doesn't really give them much in the way of an advantage of food or access to food because all of a sudden there's more mouths to feed. Where hyenas are a little bit different, the massive clans of hyenas in the Mara make complete sense because of the way that they work up there, both in terms of tackling predators, bigger predators like lions, but also because a hyena clan isn't always together. You know, you don't find one group of 80 hyenas all together unless perhaps they're in the middle of a, a disagreement over territory during a clan war, or perhaps maybe at a carcass, but mostly hyena clans are split up. Usually the high rankers hang out with the high rankers and maybe some males, and sometimes the low rankers hang out with each other, but they don't stay together in the same way that a wild dog pack stays so they are so, so tightly bonded. You'd be hard pressed to find a more tightly bonded group of social carnivores, except perhaps maybe lions. But of course, a completely different social structure. Now, just for those of you that don't know, perhaps you've only recently discovered the live safaris, because we do get new viewers every now and again on each and every safari. <laughs> Look at your beautiful white legs. You're not looking at a feral dog. This is not some mutt or some mongrel that has wandered in off the streets. This is a completely different species, a completely different genus, actually, to uh, the dogs that we know. <laughs> of course, as it does this completely dog-like pose and looks exactly like a little doggy that you could go up and rub its belly. These are wild animals of a completely different genus. They are sort of our equivalent of wolves. They're quite a lot smaller and they obviously don't live in snow, although they have been found up in the snowy mountain tops of Kilimanjaro. I love this one's tail. It's got the coolest tail. It keeps flicking it and I keep missing it. It's got a little black arrow on, the, on its tail right in the middle of the white patch. It's really cool. But of course, every time I try and draw attention to it, it puts it back down again. So what you're dealing with is actually Africa's second most endangered big carnivore or big predator. There are hardly any left. So this is something really, really special. And although we don't have the best view at the moment, and although they're not doing very much, every moment with these animals is precious because they are constantly running along the knife edge of extinction. Because once you lose a certain number of a certain species, 
A comeback is almost impossible. Right now, they're treading that very, very fine line. This pack, of course, has no idea that that is the case. Hey, puppies. I just know, I'm looking at your faces, and I just know that you are going to get up and go running off, Juma. Just looking at you, I know it. Look at that dog. It's got mischief written all over its sleepy, sleepy, sleepy face. While I wait for them to do that, hopefully Tristan is having some luck. I know he's been in search of leopards. Let's find out how that's going. Well, good luck, Jamie, with the dogs. Hopefully they do get up to no good, and hopefully they run deep into Juma. Where we are at the moment is exactly where Ali left Clalamba this morning. So we're in the right sort of place for where she could be. I'm just quickly just scanning underneath every single tree at the moment um, in the hope that we can maybe spot her just sleeping. It got quite warm after Ali left her, so I'm hoping that she eventually fell asleep. It seemed like she was kind of never going to sleep. She kind of kept drooping off and then all of a sudden would pop her head and start walking. So I'm gonna try and see if we can find her. Ali and Seb both said to me that she was still moving. Um, so, I mean, she, the chances of her still being here is very slim, but it's worth us just double checking and having a little bit of a look around. She might've just found herself a nice comfy spot to lie down. So that's what we're looking for is anywhere where there's a bit of shade and maybe a nice little termite mound with some shade on top of it. Um, those are all good places for a little leopard to hide out. Also in a tree, um, Clalamba is not that scared of sitting up in trees by herself. Um, and so we're just having a little look around in the hope that we can spot her in one of these kind of big marulas or something like that. But it's going to be tricky. I mean, it's, this is probably one of the biggest blocks on Torchwood. And so finding her in this is really not going to be easy. But what... Now, a lot of you are saying you think that she would be great for TV. I agree with you. I think she's always going to be good quality for TV. I just want to see... I wonder what that is. There's a maroon tree over there with a big bump in it. I don't think it's a leopard, but let me just double check and make sure. So no, not a leopard. It is just the way the branch turns. It looks as though there might be something sleeping. It's against the light, so I can't see color. Um, color is always your friend when you see things in trees because leopards often appear a lot lighter than the foliage around them. So. That's why I was just having a little look. Now, this termite mound would be a good place to look, except that it's quite sort of sunny here, so not ideal for a little leopard like Clalamba to spend too much time in a sunny spot like that. So we're gonna just try and check more of the shady areas. There's some really nice big trees here and to my right. And so one of these trees will be probably a good place to check underneath them or somewhere close. Um, she, I suppose, could want to go for water, which means that we, if we find the nearest water point, which I think would be Torchwood Dam. Dingo, you say that branch is close to my head? Yes, well, there's been a few these last few days, and maybe it'll knock some sense into me and, and knock some ability to find a leopard into me again, because we've been struggling a little bit with finding our spotty cats, but one learns very quickly how to dodge um, branches when driving around in places like this. <sighs> I don't see her anywhere here. I'm not sure we're going to find her here. I think what the best plan is now is maybe just to go back onto the roads and just check she hasn't come out of here. If she hasn't come out of here, well then the next best plan is to be on foot for a while and maybe just listen for some alarm calls or something like that. But I want to just check this grove of trees in my over here because her general direction was kind of coming to where I am now. Um, and so this will be a good spot to check around. The problem is, is that the grass is so long that it's really tricky to see anything. I mean, we're going to have to literally drive right on top of her before we're going to spot her, I'm afraid, unless she's up and elevated. All right, well, let's keep trying. Let's see what we get. You never know. Good things can come to those who try. And so in the meantime, up to David, who's also trying to find the cats that he's looking for this afternoon.
Well, Tristan, I have to tell you, uh, this is one of my many afternoons where I have got almost thinking or almost trying to say, I'm getting a little bit frustrated by this afternoon because all the animals I always have hoped to have seen by now, they're almost all over. But I think I have so much love for the sausage tree pride that I tend to forget that the other animals count. And then Bungay is teasing me and he's telling me it's because I did not go to church and I did not know today is a Sunday until he told me, well, I've decided to take a different direction and temporarily forget about the sausages. Sausages is a pride of lions that live around this place and it's my favorite pride, so I've said it, I'll forget about it first, look for something else and maybe in the process of looking for something else, I might bump into them so i'm looking for anything big anything small and more so something big possibly if i'm lucky looking even for elephants or for giraffes and it all depends on the luck that i will have with myself it's just a truck that's coming in front of me i just want to very quickly wave at them and then tell them good luck so just give me two seconds i want to find out if there's something uh, very interesting yuko malishuka well, if you're lucky, this could be the day. And my friends are telling me they're equally frustrated like me. So those cubs, I would be more than happy if we see them. Now, there's that one female who we think she is the newest mother, Kingtail, because she got a little knot on her tail. She is the newest mother and all of us, all of us, are dying to see her cubs because they'll be the latest addition in that pride. We got two other females that had their cubs much earlier. Uh, one that has two, another one called Lim that has one that has three, and then the latest cubs you've seen are of a female called Mitty who got four. So we're talking of seven cubs, of course, with a different, uh, uh, big difference of age, and now that makes seven. We do not know how many cubs Kinky got. And if maybe she's going to get three, will you believe we'll have 10 cubs in that pride? Now, 10 cubs from five females, that would make 15. And the two boys that keep roaming in that particular area or in that territory that are called the Ondonio Pike. Wow, well, that pride would be growing and it will be becoming very big. The Mara Triangle has so many prides of lions. The largest currently is called Olololo, which is very close to our camp, but have always loved the sausages because of how they behave. So those cubs, we can't wait. And I'm trying to remember. <laughs> giraffe girl, how are you? And I'm surprised you're there. And very nice to hear your name, giraffe girl. Yes, I said giraffe girl. Because giraffe girl, I tell you, I've been looking for lions. I've been looking for the sausage tree pride. And our giraffe girl, if you look carefully, you can see the size of the grass. This is so tall. And for that reason, I decided I'm going to change and forget the lions for some time and look for giraffes. You are absolutely correct. I spoke of a giraffe. So stay close. Don't go anywhere. If it's not me, Tristan, James, or Jamie, we most likely will get a giraffe for you. And the advantage of a giraffe, I need about two, three kilometers from where I am. I don't even need to use my Falu because my binocular assist to spoil a giraffe. I should be able to spot. One minute, giraffe girl. Speak of the devil. Giraffe girl, I hope you're still there. Let's see whether I spoke too soon or... Let's see what I'm seeing, giraffe girl. Stay right there. Don't go away. This guy should stop moving. All righty, giraffe girl. See? Speak of the devil. Uh, thank you. I'm, I'm in the final control. It's well done. And I think it's also well done to Giraffe Girl because Giraffe Girl, there you are. And that looks like a big boy just walking across the savannah. And knowing how tall giraffes are. Giraffe girl, I'll request you don't give me so much pressure because you know you are a good friend and stick with the giraffe for the moment. But I like getting pressure giraffe girl in my life. So if you're happy with the giraffes, I'm equally happy and then it makes my life easier 
when we think of giraffe, uh, uh, elephants, I mean uh, lions. And I don't know that those uh, three, how many Pungay can we see? Giraffe gully, we can count. We might see four in that particular herd. We've got those two giraffe gull that are walking there, but looking behind them carefully, as much as the grass is pretty high, there are two more. Well, giraffe gull is good to give us pressure because we always tell you, you know, let us know what you'd like to see and we'll try and look for it. So I would say giraffe gull, you're the one lucky one that at least for today, this girl, I guess, this is my very fast animal for the last 45 minutes because I've been looking for sausages, lions, sausages, lions. And I think it's always very good to have a little change. See how tall the grass is? That is the red oat grass which, as you see the giraffes marching through it there, they are not bothered, or rather, put it this way, they are not interested in it, because giraffes are browsers, and they'll only eat very small leaves, very small twigs from the trees, and any time we see them bending down like where they are, they'll not be eating grass, but small little herbs or creepers that will be growing, you know, on the ground. But these are classical examples of browsers, browsers uh, herbivores that will only eat leaves or small low bushes and not bothered with the grass. This is a Maasai giraffe. These particular giraffes don't care about, you know, the grass. How, I mean, the grass looks pretty green to me. It's, I would say, very nutritious from the look, but giraffes being browsers Definitely their destination is to look for a small little bush that could have some leaves and there's a little ego there. Not sure it's a black chested snake ego, that's my guess. And the giraffe just passed it on that tortured tree. I can only see the white breast uh, from a distance. And my guess is either black, I mean uh, the black chested snake ego. See the size of the grass as Bunge is showing you there. This grass will have to wait until the wildebeest come. You'd imagine this to me would be a lot of food for these giraffes, but they are not bothered. Yes, so we can three, the one in the front and those two at the back. And I was saying earlier, you can imagine how tall this grass is. That's almost getting to the belly of these giraffes. And knowing giraffes are equally tall, you know, six feet more or less on the feet. Uh, you can tell that this grass is quite high. And of course, it benefited. Yes, I agree with you, and this is very ticklish, because even for us, when we walk in this grass, it's either a little ticklish, or we end up, you know, uh, scratching ourselves because of the pollen. But as you say, I think the bellies of these herbivores are quite sensitive and definitely quite ticklish. And I'm guessing that one is a girl. Keep moving, keep moving, and I would highly doubt the wild dogs Jamie has would be seen walking through this grass. Well done, Gigi, for finding a giraffe this afternoon. We have not moved in the slightest, and this is this is pretty much standard for a muggy afternoon like this afternoon. We've got to hope that they stay this way right up until half past six. I mean, a bit of movement's fine. If they want to come out into the open, maybe go have a drink, that'd be great. Because, of course, then all of you get to enjoy them properly as well. This is exactly what happened when BK went out on his first drive with me. It was, I don't think it was his first time seeing wild dogs, but it was his first time properly seeing them. And I told him, I'm sure some of you remember, it was the Hamilton's pack, not far from where we are now. And I told him that wild dogs can get up and race off at any minute. And they spent the next hour curled up in little fluff balls, not going anywhere. And I think he was starting to think that I was completely loopy. These wild dogs are very snoozy. Jess wants to know if male dogs will leave the pack to start their own when they are mature. 
The interesting thing about wild dogs is that it's typically the females that actually disperse. So usually within <clears throat> most mammals, it's the males, you know, if you're talking about most mammal predators, it's the males that disperse. So typically a young male leopard will move off in search of territory and the females and the, and the females' daughters will stick around the same area. And the same goes for lions. Prides are the guardians of an area and the guardians of the genetics. Eyes. And then the males will, once they reach about three years old, move off and establish themselves elsewhere. But with dogs, it doesn't exactly work like that. That doesn't mean that males never disperse or never break away, but typically females will actually move off into in search of new mating opportunities. And that makes sense because their biological drive is to breed. And the alpha female typically doesn't allow a beta female or anything like, or any of the other females below her to raise a set of cubs so oh, pups what is wrong with me i've been thinking about hyenas i think mm. clearly she will she typically doesn't allow another female to raise a set of pups she often kills them it does happen but it makes sense then that the females it's not like with lions where cubs from every female are welcomed with open arms and with an open milk bar as well and they allosuckle each other's little cubs with the alpha female, she tends to guard that privilege quite jealously. So it makes sense for the females to move off and to disperse. Listen here, fly. Sorry. Goodbye. That was the last straw. Trying to climb into my ear was not acceptable. Tiny, tiny little flies. It's a horrible feeling when they get in there. Right, as thoroughly, thoroughly captivating as these wild dogs are right now, off you go across to James before his warthog runs away. We have got a wart pig, everybody. There it is, as you can see. It's a real brief sighting because it is, uh, well, not a wart pig born of enormous bravery. It's disappeared into some thick bush along with its babies. We have found nothing, I'm afraid. I did go for a walk to an area where Tristan said he had squirrels alarm calling yesterday and he watched a hyena walk in there and he didn't have time to go in. We found absolutely nothing. I gave it a thorough walk around. Oh, the pig is back. Well spotted, David. And so, no luck on that front. We're now on the eastern boundary. We're going to squiz around here for a while. See what we can find. Well done, a wart piglet. A small water pig. Let me verse slightly, David. Thank you for clicking so that I knew you were coming back to me. Oh, they really are not particularly forthcoming. Matter of fact, you say birthday pig for Hosanna. Well, I mean, if you're the pig, that would be very unfortunate. But yes, I suppose if you're Hosanna, a little bit of pork would be a good idea. I must say, water pig is a delicious meat if you've ever had it. Now, there is a water buck, otherwise known as an aqua buck. That was uh, started by Kirsten McLennan Smith in the directing chair. And for a long time, David Gitu thought that we called water buck down here in South Africa aqua bucks. So he would come across them and say, ah, oh, some aqua buck. And until a few months later, I said, you know, I think the joke's wearing a bit thin. He said, what joke? I said, you know, the aqua buck joke. And he said, what aqua buck joke? And he didn't know. The air here is now filled with the scent of smoky leather, which is the smell of water buck. I quite enjoy the smell, actually. It's quite comforting. It's a little bit like uh, sniffing a glass of Laphroaig. Apparently the wild dogs are now awake, and they're about an hour and a half from walking into Chitwa Chitwa, I think. Okay, well, that one's asleep, but the rest of the pack are awake. I don't want to talk over the sounds, though. Just listen.
definitely, hands down, one of my favorite, favorite sounds. I haven't moved yet, because, yes, please. Yes, good, good puppies. Good puppies. That's right. East. East little puppies. <laughs> They're so excited all of a sudden. It's amazing how they go from completely dead asleep to squeak, squeak, squeak. We're wide awake. Mom, dad, everybody up. Everybody up. Oh, a tissue. Are you voting? Are you voting whether or not to go hunting? <laughs> I'm sorry. I know I shouldn't joke about a very serious scientific article, but it's um, it's an article that appeared a couple of years ago, I think. It must be about two years ago now, about wild dogs voting as to whether or not they go hunting by sneezing. It has been met with a degree of skepticism by certain parties. I'm just going to go... I'm going to move around. Might as well move, change our position anyway. The adults are not going anywhere. But let's, yeah. Hang on, no, we are. East. East. You don't want to go running into the sun. It's bright. Go, go the other way. Then you'll be able to see what's out there. Yes, you beautiful thing. No, no sneezing. No sneezing now. Only start to sneeze at half past six. No, that's west. That's west. Okie dokie. Hold on, folks. We're gonna move. I just wanna be in a position to be able to move if and when I need to. Oh, I'm about to sleep in the shade. That's marvelous. I think hopefully that was just a toilet, a brief toilet, toilet break. And Charles said that wild dogs are very street-like. They've got West Side Story vibes going on. Yeah, I could see it. They're sleek. They fit. I can definitely see the, the West Side Story-esque aspect to their nature. You expect them to break into a song and dance across, certainly not rooftops, but... Yes, they do. They, they click but probably not while we're watching them. And we, is, perhaps we should name one Maria. Hmm. Are we back to sleep? Listen, doggies, where we were was quite nice because it was, there was shade for us too. Just, just gonna put that out there. You know, if you wanted to go back there, that would be okay, temporarily, for we are now feeling the full force of the blazing February sunlight. Uh, these dogs are not going back to sleep, I don't think. They're listening across to the... Oh, there it is. Whenever I look at a shot like that, I immediately think of Rite of Spring, Stravinsky. Uh, the fantastic Fantasia scene with the dinosaurs. Now, Ravinda wants to know, moving on from Stravinsky and the Rite of Spring, whether or not the, how many, or how many wild dogs there are in this pack. There's eight, if this is the pack I'm thinking of. There's one female, three adult males, and then four pups. Four little pups. Well, they're not so little anymore. They're almost indistinguishable from the adults. But the Mbali pack has eight members. I don't know which one is the alpha male yet. We know which, obviously, there's only one female, therefore she is the alpha. All right, well, that was truly impressive, but while we wait for the wild dogs to get up and start hunting, James has a hornbill that has already been successful. Some action there. Yes, it's there, David, there. A hornbill. It has caught itself a caterpillar, and as a result of Judy H. and James Richard's explanation of a moth we saw on this very car the other day, I believe that that is one of the hawk moths that we saw there, uh, that we saw the other day. I believe that is the caterpillar of that very moth. Um, I was just trying to look it up again, but I've unfortunately forgotten what the thing was called. Convolvulus, there we go. Convolvulus moth. Convolvulus moth. 
Uh, I know that because my mother grows convolvulus flowers. I couldn't tell you what they look like, but uh, that's what she does. And they're fat and green. So I think that may well have been what that was. We're driving up the eastern boundary, hoping to see some tracks of something coming in. Um, otherwise, oh, I don't really know. Also, apparently the welding on the antenna at the back is about to come off, which is a little disconcerting. So if you hear the following, ah! that means it's come off and fallen on David's head. It'd be so nice to just find Tandi or Tingana draped across one of these beautiful marula branches. Yes, indeed, Lauren, they are called convolvulus moths because that is one part of their diet. They do eat other things. There are obviously a number of different species that look quite similar, but that one was called the convolvulus moth. Convolvulus hawk moth. There you are, James and Judy. I hope you are impressed that the, I remembered one name. It's better than I normally manage. Driving very slowly. Now, it wasn't too far from here that Tandi and Tingana were the other day. Uh, grumpy old man, no, duct tape has not been used for the antenna, but cable ties have. Of course, it is a well-known fact that Wild Earth, the company in its entirety, would cease to function without cable ties and gaffer tape. Without those two things, you wouldn't have a show. You might think it all has to do with technology, sophisticated broadcast technology, incredible tracking skills and wonderful Land Rovers. But no, it doesn't. It has to do almost entirely with gaffer tape and cable ties. Yeah, really not much going on here at all. I think we'll drive a little bit faster and perhaps head up to Beefelsook Waterhole. All right, David, unfortunately, has not yet found the sausage tree pride, but we'll see if it's getting closer. Very good, James. Now, I told you earlier, uh, the times when you get frustrated by one particular animal, you forget it and you look for something else. And I decided, let me forget my lions, the sausage tree pride for some time. I look for something else. And there I got giraffes. And I am not 100% sure. I'll only request we hold our fingers or we cross our fingers like this because I might be seeing something even more interesting that uh, Jamie and James will be very jealous about. So it might take me another two or three minutes to get there, but a friend of mine has told me there could be some spotted cat somewhere. I mean, let me see whether you can get an idea. We see, oh, we've got so many spotted cats here in Kenya in the Mara Triangle, but there's one that we rarely see. So I want you to tell me which one you think it is before we get there. So keep guessing and I'm sure we'll have an idea of what this cat is. Just give me an idea and I'll give you about 30 seconds to tell me what I'm talking about. He's a cat, we've seen them, we've seen it before, but tell me what could I be talking about. He's a cat I saw at the beginning of the year and I saw it another one week ago and we might be seeing it in the next 10 seconds. What do you think I'm talking about? Let's find out what I got. In one, two, three. Nature girl, pretty close, pretty close, nature girl, pretty close, but it's related to cheetah nature girl. Very good, nature girl, just hang on for a minute. Nature girl, and I'm gonna give you an angle that Bungay, uh, Bungay, tell me, do I keep going? That's good. All right, nature girl, you're so close. A clap for you, nature girl. But now in counting, one, two, three, four, five. 
look at that. I have no words. I am so happy because we have spotted a leopard of our own. We got leopards in the Mara. We rarely see them, but when we see them, it's always a big day. And M in the final control says, that is awesome. And truly it is. And I'm trying to look at her. Let me call it her for now. But let me, I may call it, I might call it more him than her because by the size of the head, I think it is a male leopard. Not very sure. I'm sure I might be getting confirmation from all the viewers who know this particular leopard. And I'm guessing this could be the shepherd tree male leopard. I'll put it there. I could be wrong, but this could be the shepherd tree male leopard. And if it is, how awesome is that? I first saw it at the beginning of the year. Aviad, you say Hosan is a long way. And I can tell you, Aviad, this gentleman here, by any standard, he is big. Look at him in any form or shape. You look at him, he is a big boy. And I might consider, I might compare him to Tingana. I do not know, and I'm sure M is going to tell Jamie and Jim and Tristan what they think. But uh, from your screen there, M, yeah, thank you very much, Bungay. For me, this is a male leopard, and I'm more convinced than ever before because of the dewlap that he got. Yes, yes, yes. I think I would agree with you, uh, M. Nefino Control, because the two main characters, I would say main characters, because the very unique male leopards in Juma, Hukumuri and Tingana, and M is more, he's more Hukumuri. And I would agree with you, that shape of the head, and the color of the eyes, to me, you're right, they are more of hukumuri. So one thing I can now tell you 100%, this is a male. And I'm almost being convinced it could be the shepherd tree male leopard. How are you, sir? Now, if you look below the neck, you can see the dewlap I'm talking about. And it's very conspicuous in the males, unlike the females. So definitely, I'm now convinced he's a male. And I want to lean to the shepherd tree leopard. Now, you can see the chin spots that have always been used to identify these leopards. And that's one thing we haven't done here in Kenya. And hopefully, maybe one day we'll be able to do that. But knowing the territory he is in, I can tell for a fact this uh, is the tree shepherd. Uh, because this is where I saw him, I guess, a week ago or so. This must be the shepherd tree leopard. Vicky, thank you very much. Great comment. He is massive. And Vicky, he is very good looking. And just staying on top of that tavern mound. What a view he got. You can see the heartbeat of those blood vessels under his neck. Look at that dewlap there. And yeah, he's either Hukumuri or Tingana, but I would say he is more similar to Hukumori in terms of size and everything else. The size of the head, the shape of the head. So we always say leopards got rosettes. Gemma, how are you today? And always uh, jolly to hear your name. He is a big boy. I have no idea how old this uh, boy is, but from the face to me, he could be like slightly over nine, maybe going to 10. He looks pretty tired male. He is an old boy, Gemma. And also looking at his nails. You see, Gemma, we have always thought of young leopards like Hosanna, for example, Tralamba, for example, their noses are always a bit pinkish, and that would also happen to lions. Now, he is so sleepy. Why are you sleeping that early? Is it because of your age? Because Gemma, Gemma said you're old. I don't think so. But yeah, if you look at him closely, Gemma, you see there's no pink on the nose, and being without a pink, my guess is definitely over six, seven. So anything eight, nine? Well, it could be pretty good edge for him. Look at the eyes. Very dark eyes that he got. I could be wrong, but I think his ears look a little bit short than the normal ears we see on leopards. But I could be wrong, exactly fitting the description of Hukumuri. 
Shepherd True Leopard, did you have a sneeze? Like the wild dogs of Jamie? Or did you just have a little reflex there? Or you got irritated by a fly? Well, I'm very excited because for us to sport leopards in the Mara is always very special. And I'm sure uh, Jamie, as much as she got wild dogs, she might feel well done, David. It promises to be an exciting sighting, but for now it is a very restful, relaxing sighting. But well done, Gigi. A leopard in the Mara is always a special, special thing. Now that's awesome news. You know, it hurt my soul quite a few times in the Mara when I encountered a leopard on one of our all-nighters and had to leave it in favour of whatever else that we were, whatever else we were following largely because wherever I found them was areas where we didn't have signal. But it happened non-live far more often than it ever happened live. So well done, David. That's exciting news. I wonder which male it is. I'm sure Adam, who works up at Angama and who's sort of starting to collate all of the various Mara leopard sightings, I'm sure he'll be very excited to hear that. Okay, fly. Goodbye. There's one. Two down. To a fallen victim to my reflexes. <laughs> Nat would like to know if I think the wild dogs have eaten since the sighting this morning or if they are looking fatter. They didn't look particularly well fed. They don't look that hungry. But I always feel as though wild dogs have a, have a hungry look to them. If they did eat something, it was very, very small. Perhaps a scrub hair. Obviously, I wasn't out this morning, so I didn't see them. So I'm not... I don't know exactly what they looked like, but if they did, it was probably very little. But they've got... We arrived, they've got no blood on their faces. They're almost exactly where Tristan lost them this morning. So I don't think that they've managed to eat. Which is why... If you're listening, wild dogs, you need to go directly to quarantine at around about half past six this evening. Yes, yes. You're listening, you're taking that in. <laughs> you're just a puppy. You don't know what I'm talking about. Quarantine, by the way, for those of you that don't know, you might have completely misinterpreted that. I'm not in any way suggesting these dogs need to be placed in quarantine. It is the name of an open area on Juma. So don't panic. I'm not saying that they're diseased or anything like that. It's just the name of an open area. That's why they must go to quarantine. <laughs> it occurred to me as I said it that that would be very confusing for a new viewer, particularly since our new viewers seem to be quite shy about asking questions. We know you're out there. Remember that you can actually interact with us and you can do that using the hashtag Safari Live on Twitter. Alternatively, you can send your questions through on the YouTube chat stream. All right, since our snoozy wild dogs aren't rushing off anywhere, off you go up across to David's magical Mara leopard sighting. Well, hopefully your wild dog, Jamie, will stay until later tonight, as I'm also crossing fingers and hoping that my le male leopard here will also stay until rather late. And I'm so excited by this leopard, and uh, not sure whether M you'd like us to have a bigger uh, cover match ground with all other online viewers, you know, who could also benefit from this very rare sighting of a male leopard in the male triangle. Hello everyone and a very warm welcome to the Mara Triangle in Kenya and my name is David and on camera this evening is Bunge. Bunge, how are you? And you're very excited because we've got a very rare sighting here of a leopard. Not rare in that sense. We see leopards 
here in the Mara Triangle, but they are rather elusive and they're always rather difficult to see as much as they're seen in Juma or in the Kruger National Park in South Africa. So for us here in Kenya, and most in the Mara Triangle, when we spot a leopard, we get very excited. Well, this one, number one, it is a male, and I'm saying it's a male because of a few reasons. The size is huge, he is a big boy. Two, he got a huge head, and in general, males got bigger heads than females. Thank you, Bungay. Again, as I said earlier, Bungay is the cameraman with me today. And number three, if you look below his neck, you can see some piece of muscle hanging there that we call a dewlap. So dewlaps are more generally uh, fitting or they're more seen in the males, unlike the females. Now, we're coming to you live, and should you have any questions, and comments, please send them through. And how exciting is this? We have some perfect light, great temperatures, and we could be doing close to 85 degrees Fahrenheit or up to about 30 degrees Celsius. And look at him. He just pushed and looking in a particular direction. And what I think he's looking at are some impalas from a distance. When I was driving here before I found him, I passed it through some impalas, a small herd of impalas. And I think that's what he is trying to focus on. If not, he could also be focusing on, on maybe something like a warthog. So he is patched up you know, on a tamen mound. Ravinda, how are you? And always a pleasure to hear your name. And you'd like to know, could a leopard like this bring down a buffalo? I do not think so, Ravinda. I highly doubt. But, Ravinda, I'm sure you know male leopards, fully grown ones, could be anything 65, 70 kilograms, 80 kilograms, maybe the very heaviest one. I have seen some of the leopards in the Mara bring down prey that is almost double their weight double their size. I'm talking of a topi. Michael, you're also asking what his name is, and I'm sure going to tell you his name. So, Ravinda, I've, I was just saying earlier that I've seen leopards that are, you know, 70, 75 kilograms, 140, 150 pounds, bringing down huge prey, the sizes of topi or uh, hartebeest that are double the size or double the weight of leopards. But I highly doubt it to bring down a buffalo. But I can tell you, Ravinda, for a baby buffalo, for a calf, it's very easy for them to bring them down. And apparently, Ravinda, they also drag them up the tree. Now, Michael, this leopard here, is called the Shepherd Tree Leopard. We have been seeing him around here, and this, Michael, is his territory. Shepherd Tree Leopard is his name. Keep sending through your questions and comments because they are coming to you live from the Mara Triangle in Kenya. I was saying earlier, Daniel, very good, and I'm very happy to hear your name, Daniel, again, and I'm sure you remember this. This is exactly about a month ago because, Daniel, it was the very first day of 2019. He is the same male that was meeting with that particular unknown female, and if... Daniel, that female conceived that day, I can tell you in another two months, we might be seeing a cub or two cubs with that particular female. Daniel, you are absolutely correct. It's the same male that we saw meeting that day, and this is the shepherd tree male. Hello, sir. You are gorgeous. You are good looking. I was just saying earlier, I didn't finish my thoughts. He is patched up, or he is, you know, laying down on a tamad mound, and a tamad mound gives it and a tamed mount gives it a vantage point to be able to see its surrounding killer. Very good. You see, what an amazing animal. And I'll tell you, leopard's killer in the Mara are always a bit skittish, and we always tend to see them on top of trees. Anytime you see them on the ground, they are always on the move, but just to see him there, killer, resting, it is just super special. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I want to thank you so very much for having joined us, for your question, for your comments. And please keep an eye because we might be sending you uh, more alerts in the very near future. And on behalf of my cameraman, Bungay, and myself, David, very many thanks. And you can keep watching us on the YouTube as usual. Goodbye for now.
Very good. Welcome back. And my leopard remains here. And as I said, it's a male. And it's called the tree. The shepherd tree leopard. Very relaxed, very composed. And definitely maybe looking at some food and thinking where he might be getting dinner tonight. But I won't tell you, I thought I could be the only one winning and the proud guy or the proud guy in Kenya. But I think James is trying to catch up with me and maybe a similar luck that he got. Well, we are having a bit of luck here with the leopard Tristan's been looking for. It is, of course, Tlalamba. I haven't seen her for a long time. Hello, Tlalamba. How are you? <laughs> nice to see you. Something of a uh, relief, to say the least, I must say. And a little butterfly there. Now, is she looking for her mother? Where is her mother? Where is her father? That is what hopefully Tristan will uncover for us fairly shortly. Now, when we left her this morning, she was, of course, on Torchwood. It's not too far from where we are now. We're at Gwari Pan. Bone Crusher Queen, you say that she's the most beautiful leopard. Well, Bone Crusher Queen, uh, she might be. I'd also like to know, in her, your opinion, who the ugliest leopard in the world is, and I'd be very careful for answering that question, because you may, of course, be attacked, cyber-bullied. But yes, she's pretty. Interestingly, her, um, her nose is already nearly black. It's not that pinkish colour of Hosanna's. It's just slightly sort of grey-pink, pink-grey, greyish-pinkish. Know what I mean, David? You don't? Oh. Well, I suggest you open your eyes and have a look. <laughs> I do hope she doesn't go far from here, because there are not many places that she can go from here which will not result in my breaking this car. So just stay right where you are. Ta -la 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 I'm now going to have to tell Tristan about this. He's going to be not entirely pleased. Sorry, I'm I'm gonna have to get hold of Tristan now. I think he's got tracks, actually, of a of Tandi. Stations, we've just bumped into Tlalamba at Quarry Pan. Sorry about that, Tristan. <laughs> I can just see steam now coming out of Tristan's ears. <laughs> very big effort to find her and we've just driven along and bumped her but that is the way of the wilderness I'm afraid <laughs> Emma says of course, Emma can see Tristan of course and there is steam coming out of his ears beautiful Linda, you say even David found the leopard. Um, I'll have you know, and I still don't know how this happened, but when David was here with us at Juma, he found uh, he found leopards just about every time he went out. He'd just go out and say, I think I want to find Talamba today, because he can't say Talamba. And lo and behold, she would appear for him. He wouldn't track her, she'd just pitch up. He'd say the same about Tandi, same story, same about all the leopards. And he had a remarkable run of luck when he was over here. So, well, while it might be slightly unusual that he's found a leopard in the Masai Mara, uh, well, he was certainly no slouch over here. <laughs> David says he's blushing. 
That I would like to see. <laughs> so she's just getting herself ready for TV. She will be having her makeup in about well, about half an hour. We'll get the makeup guys through here. They'll just put a bit of dark makeup around her eyes, perhaps. And I'm not sure what shoes they've chosen for her today. I think it's the green stilettos. Foggy, the TV episodes are online, yes. If you just stay watching until half past seven, you'll get them. But shh. You'll also get them without adverts. <laughs> she's quite hot, you can see. She's panting away there. I'm tempted to move around to the other side of her, but I'm also tempted to just stay exactly where we are and less, you know, lest the moving of the vehicle moves her. All right, let us go back across to the leopard man of the Masai Mara, David Gadamakotho, and the sun going down behind his cat. Well, hopefully, Jamie will keep her wild dogs. James will keep Tulalamba. She is a nice girl, very cooperative, maybe having been spotted this hour. And I might also be lucky to keep my shepherd tree leopard. Who knows? Now, the direction he is looking at for anybody who could be joining us now, I see it is a male, and definitely, if you look below the tail, you can tell 100% it is a male, apart from its big size, big neck, big head, which males will have and not the females. So the direction he's looking at is the west, and you can see <clears throat> the color of sun like there is that the sun is going down. Not sure that he'll be looking at the sunset like me, and maybe if that's the kiss, we'll be enjoying the golden moment together. I'm sure he's got some drooly uh, mouth or some saliva coming out of his mouth. I'm not sure that's what I saw. Something looked like uh, a spider web. I'll be looking carefully if she turns to her left, to his left rather. I'll be able to know what exactly I saw. Well, he's very focused in a particular direction and I can only think of two things. Number one, uh, some sort of prey and the impalas I saw earlier. Well, Lan, very good, very good. Now, that's very good. You have really reminded me that I need to have all of you. I mean, the light that we have, look at that sea of grass of the red oat grass, the shepherd tree leopard there, and the sunset. So to all of you, may I request for a one-word tweet. Tell me what do you think of this sighting. One-word tweet, as you show, hashtag Safari Live on Twitter. So seeing something drooling there, either from his mouth, not very sure, it could be. When they get to this particular age, that happens a lot. Yeah, it seems like little silly me kind of mouth so remember one word say tell me anything what do you think i mean epic magical i mean i don't want to tell you the words you have them hashtag safari love on twitter or this shepherd tree leopard the grass or the savannah in the mara triangle and the sun as it is setting or as we're seeing the sun going down he is seated very comfortably on a tamid mound and Bungay is trying to catch him, the savannah or the grass, and the beautiful golden light that is just coming through. Look at how beautiful that he got. And that's why maybe way back, you know, people used to hunt leopards and they could get their skins hides either to make coats or shoes or hats. But luckily, that has since stopped and we like making our hats or shoes or handbags right on the screen like what you're watching now i would say he's quite old male maybe nine ish ten ish years old there from the look of his face 
and the size, but I would say he's a very prime, prime male. What can you see that we can't see? It's interesting how these animals are designed with wonderful visions. Many times they'll see and we look in the same direction they are looking and we see nothing. The next minute we see them doing stalking, doing a chase and catching something for themselves. Snago, well done, golden. It couldn't be better than that. Thank you for that good comment, Snago, because, I mean, if you look on the uh, sports, Snago, or the resorts, uh, the rosettes, they are not sports. You see there's a bit of gold in them and the gold, again, in the grass and the golden sun as the sun is going down. Golden describes the three very well in one word. The rosettes, the grass, and the golden sun going down. Thank you, Bungay for making it so real. I mean, it looks to me like a painting. Ali, gorgeous, thank you very much. It's so gorgeous that the times you look and you're like, one minute. Uh, David, tell us you and Bungay are not faking something if that is a painting. But thanks for the Shepherd Tree Leopard for turning your face. And that will convince Ali that this definitely is not a painting. Very, very good. Golden, super good. Gorgeous, super good. Please keep sending your one word tweet. Hashtag Safari Live on Twitter. Kerika, you say Africa. Exactly. I mean, there is no better way of looking at this. But, you know, it's really Africa. And when you see this, you're like, wow, thank you, Africa. And maybe thank you, Safari Live, for what? you know, we you bring to us. And this is all our magic and how surprising and how special to see this. How cool it is to see a male leopard in the savannah. A very, a very unusual area to see leopards because we'll always associate them to bushes, thickets, trees. But when I spoke to my friend, he was like, you know what, I think there's a leopard somewhere. And from where I was, I definitely knew it must be the shepherd tree leopard, and chances are the male. The female that doesn't live very far from here is always very skittish. I would say for every 10 times you see leopards here, it's always this boy. And look at that sun there. See all the trees there that you call the tortured trees? And in the background is the Ololoro escarpment, and the sun is trying to push down and giving us the best colors of any Sunday evening. It's going to be truly a special Sunday. I initially started with a bit of frustration with the Society Pride, but now I am so, so very happy having seen this male leopard, and I don't think he's in a hurry to go anywhere. I also highly doubt the wild dogs are going anywhere. I'm definitely not going anywhere. This is thoroughly relaxing, waiting for these wild dogs to get up and move with the sound of the bush. You know, I'm pretty up with the sort of the stage lingo and the TV lingo. And as Emma has just pointed out, this is what's known as corpsing. <laughs> no, must not corpse. Must not corpse. The dogs are still here. They have not moved. I'm awake. I'm wide awake. I, the steering wheel is not particularly comfortable but I have experienced far worse in the Mara and I have actually fallen asleep. I once fell asleep with my forehead against it, and sort of with my head resting up against it like this. It was just before Earth Live, the actual Earth Live, and I fell asleep like this because I kept getting shouted at for moving the car every time I tried to get comfortable. It was on the back end of five all-nighters. Oh, hello. We're up. It's always the danger. Don't you go falling, falling asleep. Squeak, squeak, squeak. Puppies, why do you always go do that behind the bush? Oh, here comes another one. Okay, time to move. Time to move. And just like that, we go from a sleepy sighting to up and moving. And I think what's happening here is that the pups are quite hungry. 
and they're trying to encourage the adults of the pack to go off and go hunting. Oops. Sorry, Seb, you okay? Yeah, it's just my water bottle. Oh, it didn't oh, land on your foot. Actually, yeah. You didn't land on your foot. No, no, no. I just heard this thud that I could just imagine a metal water bottle landing on you. Ouch. Standing by. That's just myself here. They're now up and in the open. They haven't, they're still static though. Uh, AFM, I'll keep you updated. Sorry guys, have to speak over the squeaking. <laughs> I'm not quite sure how to tell the person who asked me if they could come in 15 minutes to join us that I may, may not have the dogs in 15 minutes. Hey squeakies. Oh, they are so gorgeous. Aren't they just the most beautiful creatures? Like somebody threw splashes of paint on them, especially the white. White is always more defined on the wild dogs. The tan and the black sort of bleeds into each other, but the white stands out. What's the plan, puppies? I think the puppies want the adults up and the adults are not quite ready for this whole hunting thing to start. <laughs> Painted Wolf says food. Yeah, well, not yet. Sleep for now. Painted Wolf, of course, has secured their username. That is actually one of the proposed names for the wild dog. Oh. Squeaking, growling. So a lot of people believe, and a lot of conservation groups have actually campaigned for this, that the name wild dog creates a very bad misconception that basically what we're dealing with here is some sort of feral dog, which of course is not the case. So it's been proposed that the wild dog is officially renamed the Painted Wolf, which I think is a really lovely name. Either Painted Dog or Painted Wolf, I think Painted Wolf works quite well, but then it suggests a much closer relationship between wild dogs and wolves than actually exists. So maybe Painted Dog is a, is a better name, I'm not sure. It's not for me to decide. It certainly won't be, it won't hinge on my narration this afternoon. But the painter definitely has to go in there because they do look as though somebody's painted them. Our wild dogs have gone back to sleep and therefore so can I. Let's go and find out whether or not Tlalamba is awake. Yes, here we are with the Tlalamba cat in sweet repose. See, she sleeps on her back. That is a picture of a very comfortable animal, not afraid of anything enjoying the sounds of the woodland kingfisher uh, the sights indeed of the blue-billed firefinch believe it or not came visiting us recently no it's not around now david i was just mentioning what we had seen yes it's not here right now and a couple of wax bills a couple of derves it's all just rather peaceful and pretty over here Try and find your picture of this blue billed firefinch. I won't try, I'll probably succeed. <laughs> blue billed or African firefinch, I think is what we saw. Yes, I would go with that. Would you like to see it, David? Mm. Monique, you say, is she hot or full? I think she's not unfull, but she's also very hot. It's about 34 degrees today. 
It was either the Jamison's Firefinch or the Blue, Bin Blue Build Firefinch. In fact, I'm going to go with the Jamison's simply because it wasn't as dark on the back. It was much redder all the way around. So Jamison's Firefinch and his wife, Legno Stricta Repo Parira. Legno Stricta, no, Rodo Parera. See, I went to the old school there, David. I used a book as opposed to an application on my telephone. Mm. I will tell you, though, that it is pretty warm sitting where we are in the sun. Lindsay, you say this is a, a, a horsan pose, if you've ever seen one. Well... It's sort of a leopard pose, really. They quite like doing that. I've got some oxpeckers calling as well. But it's just so wonderfully peaceful. Let me shut up for 20 seconds and see if you can pick up the peacefulness of this scene, the tranquility. there is a laughing dove flanked by his honor guard of two red bulled ox pickers. If you listen very carefully you can hear the dove going <laughs> It's quite a pretty scene really isn't it David? Thank you. Thank you for that, David. All right, let's go back across to the Masai Mara where David Katambikithu, I'm sure, is being equally as peaceful as I am. Ask him to say peaceful for you. Well, leopard, it's a leopard, but a female, to a male, and maybe I'd say a youngster to a fully grown male here. I'm more convinced now he's looking at a white hog. I've turned round a few times and I don't know what he can see. Look at him. Let's just wait. See how he's coming down quietly. What can you see that I can't see? My only guess is this must be a white hog. And this is a very typical posture of a leopard wanting to hunt. I might be a bit soft. Of course, I'm about 30 meters, 40 meters away from where he is. But look at the intent on his eyes. He is very focused at something. Now, because of the height of the grass, myself, I cannot see. But Papa Ryan, you say, wow, that's a great comment. I mean, it couldn't be better. The colors, the rosettes on this particular leopard and that's a very slow move it's very quiet not sure he is still very interested with what he saw or he just want to change the position and maybe concentrate better on what he is seeing look at the tail and when the tail to me is up like that he is in business he's definitely in business until that tail will go down and is what I call or like saying a game over but as long as that tail is there there's always a kind of communication between the tail and the brain or the brain and the tail because look at how the tail is arched so it's arched in a particular angle like 90 degrees and either it's 
not given an actual some kind of balance, but there's definitely a communication uh, between that tail and that brain. And a lot of times, as much as we do not know what leopards are thinking, but their tails will always tell a lot. See, like the collar that he got on his body. So either whatever it was, it must have been a warthog that could have been disappeared in the grass and maybe not interested anymore. But either way, look at the background there of the sunset. So, so very beautiful. And I've always said, Africa, you, I don't know what other places you'd compare to Africa. Look at the sunset there and the trees that you see in the background there, that you call the Tocho trees, very iconic of the Mara Triangle. And for those of you who could be joining us now, we got a male leopard here that we call the Shepherd tree. And he's definitely focused on something. Now look at the dewlap below his neck. And that is one characteristic that will always give away a male from a female. He's blending in very well in the grass that you see there. So whatever prey he is looking at, I'm very convinced it cannot see him. Initially, it was on top of a tamarind mound. Crystal, very good question. Leopard and cheetah's differences are massive. Both of them are cats, number one. But when you look at them, in size, they're different. Leopards are much stockier, much heavy, stoutly built. That's number one. Number two, leopards have what we call rosettes. When you look at their bodies, they got rosettes. And when you look at cheetahs, they got what we call spots. Their behaviors are also very different. Uh, leopards, oops, they're going, getting sleep again. Leopards do not chase their prey for too long. They'll always look and go to the hunting mode stock on very short distances and then they latch or they pounce on the prey. Cheetahs give chases and I'm sure you know they're the first animals on earth they could comfortably do 100, 110 kilometers per hour running. Now cheetahs in general unless you get a coalition of cheetahs say two or three males or maybe a mother and her fully grown cubs, cheetahs go for small game. I'm talking about the Thompson gazelles, um, ground gazelles or impalas or babies of nyalas or kudus but leopards have been known to go for a big bigger males in general a bigger prey in general i'm talking of for example impalas they have been known to go for bigger animals than them like topies or heart beast or even for zebras you know young young falls of zebras uh quite a number of differences i am just keeping a watch at him to find out what exactly he'll be doing as the sun is going down there and ideally one of the differences leopards tend to hunt both day and night whereas cheetahs in general hunt during the day but of course there are few cases where cheetahs will hunt also at night but it's quite unusual so the major difference between the two but looking also at some commonalities between the two they are, in general, very solitary. Leopards live on their own, cheetahs on their own, not in big groups. And I just want to sit here as I watch this leopard and as watch my golden moment of the sun going down. Let's find out how active the wild dogs are. Our dogs are up and slowly moving. It's not, look at them. Oh, they're going to stop now. Now that's a very silly branch to want to play with. Not quite at full hunting speed yet, still up for distractions like the branch of a very thorny acacia. Mmm, yummy. That's not at all dangerous. I feel like such a mum, but I just want to tell it to be careful of its eyes. Here we go. We're up and moving. Hey pups, you are going in a really bad direction. I just want to say, yes, you, you're a good boy. You're a good boy. Well done. Thank you. Look at those gorgeous brown eyes. Deep, deep, deep in color. Not the light-colored eyes of a leopard or a lion. That, of course, a, indicative of a diurnal hunter. Emmy says that they would call wild dogs splotchy dogs. 
<laughs> so I suppose one up on the wild dogs, because it doesn't sound... It just sounds like a dog that's broken into a paint factory, though. And gone rolling around. Nice big yawn there. Showing off those white teeth. Yes, you're a good doggy. I like you. You're looking in the right direction. Aunt Canis wants to know whether or not wild dogs or hyena have more teeth. Wild dogs have more teeth. They have 40 teeth, which is typical of the canine or the canid family because there are, with dogs, they tend to have far more teeth than most of the other predators. The animal out here that has the most teeth, you won't see here, but you will see in the Mara, which is the bat-eared fox. But between wild dogs and hyena, you're looking at dogs. Dogs have more teeth, 40 to be exact, which is actually less than most species of dog or most members of the dog family. Very sharp, shearing, carnassial teeth. Good dogs. You stay just right there. The one thing about wild dogs, particularly for TV shows, because all of you who've been watching for a long time know how beautiful they are, but they have a tendency to be difficult to describe to TV audiences. Anyway, never mind, off you go across to Tlalamba as the sun begins its descent. Look how artistic David is being on his Sunday afternoon. Tlalamba was stalking everybody. You missed it. She stalked a dove for three seconds. Then she went back to sleep. Now she's up and looking around the place, pondering the movement of the waves in the water and thinking to herself, I wonder how it is that waves work. It looks like we have some reflection and refraction going on here, and I wonder how that affects them. I don't think she's really thinking that. I think she's thinking, where is my next meal going to come from? I may have to do the shopping myself. It's a little bit like when you're a student and you leave home for the first time aged 18, full of confidence that life is easy and you have all the answers, until you make your way to the supermarket for the very first time to buy yourself some food and realize that in fact you can no longer afford yogurt or butter or meat, those nice things, and you start finding yourself at the bulk discount store buying loo paper that would best be used as sandpaper and that sort of thing. Uh, mayonnaise that is more akin to paint stripper than it is to the mayonnaise you're used to at home, that sort of thing. And, uh, well, she's in that stage of life now where the need to, or the ability to eat fresh Diker and Stienbock and Impala is being replaced by the need to eat things like stinky terrapins. OK, we're going to go back to David Katambagetu for the end of this particular end of the show. We'll see you on TV. <laughs> <clears throat> well, what a day today to finish, you know, or to come to the end with two different predators, you know, wild dogs with Jimmy and myself with the male leopard here and James with a female or with a leopardess who I think is the princess of Joma. Now we can compare these two leopards because this one is a big boy. And from the edge or from the rough uh, age I gave him, maybe think about, you know, nine, ten years, he's a fully grown age. I mean, I'm very excited. As I said earlier, we got leopards all over Kenya, you know, and most of the Mara Triangle as it is in Juma, but we see them more in Juma than here. So every day we see 
a leopard is always a very exciting day. I started my drive today with a little bit of frustration looking for my favorite sausage pride, which I did not see anything. But how sweet to see male leopards as the day is ending well. I want to thank all of you for all your questions, for all your comments, and on behalf of my colleagues, Tristan, Jimmy, James, myself, and the camera operators who do a very good job. Thank you again and again, and hopefully we'll be seeing you again tomorrow morning. And from all of us, thank you, and goodbye.